I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 5th. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of, Elite, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Charlene Banneke, uh, principal of Vincent Farm Elementary School. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our first item of business is our agenda for this evening. Are there any additions or changes to tonight, tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Our next uh, item is a selection of speakers. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is Ann Const uh, Costantino. The second is Bosch Ferron. The third is Joanne Simpson. Number four is Garrison McLaney. Number five is Alexis Prisco. And number six and last is Charlene Benke. Thank you. Our next item is the chair's report, and I'll be brief this, uh, this evening. I want to certainly wish everyone a happy new year once again. And this new year offers a fresh beginning for us to refocus our efforts on enhancing the educational experience for our BCPS students, teachers, and staff. This year offers both challenges and opportunities as we continue through the redistricting process in the Southwest. The parents and community in this area have consistently been involved in issues affecting education, and we look forward to achieving and working with the committees and community to reach the optimum solution as we bring on positive change in this area. We recognize that there are other challenges associated with testing of our students and grading changes that are to be addressed along with other issues critical to education in Baltimore County. <laughs> the great advantage that we have is the bright, wonderful students that we're working with and some of the most talented educators in the country. We should have high expectations for ourselves. I want to focus on our ability to work effectively as a team so that we achieve what is best for our students in 2016. And speaking of our wonderful students, our next report will be from our SMA, Ms. Diksha Walia. Thank you, Mr. McDaniels. Good evening, Team BCPS. First of all, Happy New Year and welcome back. I hope everyone had a fantastic break. Seniors, we now have five months left to graduate. So it's let's time to make these next five months count by doing well in our classes, planning for our future, and preparing ourselves for life after high school. We're all almost halfway through the school year, so it's time to end this quarter off strong. Let's work hard and make sure our grades are what we want them to be. I had promised that I would provide an update on improvements we're making on school lunches. Therefore, first, I went and talked to students about their thoughts on lunches. I was very glad to hear that students are noticing the changes and improvements. Students have told me on multiple occasions that school lunches have improved since the beginning of the year. There are always things that we can work on and we will continue to work in order to encourage our students to eat lunch here with us in BCPS. Students tend to eat more snacks for lunch instead of school lunch. Therefore, it's good to hear when students are starting to eat school lunch and enjoy it more. I'll continue to work with Ms. Karen Levenstein to keep gathering student input and improving our student lunches. 
one of the, my resolutions for this new year is to do everything I can to keep our students informed and involved in our county decisions. Therefore, I've made a list of schools I'll be visiting in the next couple of months. I will start this Thursday by visiting three schools with Dr. Dance and Nick Burton Prately. I'm about to. Nick is actually not here, so I'm not going to steal his thunder. Um, so I'm happy to say that uh, at our last GA, our last Baltimore County Student Council General Assembly, students were able to provide input on the new grading policy. Uh, it was great to hear about, to talk to students about what their thoughts were and get, uh, gain improvements and suggestions <coughs> from them. I won't let I won't say too much and let Nick uh, explain more detail next time when he's here. And that concludes for this mob report for this month. Thank you, Ms. Walia. <coughs> Our next item is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices <coughs> within the purview of this board and school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to mind, remind the public that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the con conduct conduct of this meeting are out of order. Beginning with this meeting, the public comment dedicated to the second reading of policies will be prior to board member comments. I ask that you observe our timer behind me, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. At this time, we'll call our stakeholder, advisory and stakeholder groups up first. Um, we'll start with Ms. Abby Baton from TABCO. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman McDaniels, and I'm going to get it right, Ed Gillis with two S's, there you go, <laughs> Dr. Dance and members of the board. Happy New Year to you all. I hope you took time to rest and relax with your families. I know I enjoyed my time with my family. It really helps you to keep what is important in perspective. Today, however, we are focusing on an issue that has been persistently problematic. Whenever I go to a school or meet with teachers, I hear about discipline problems, not only in our high schools, but those problems have moved down to middle and elementary schools and are evident in our youngest students. What we are seeing is an epidemic of bad behaviors. These behaviors are harmful to our students, to our teachers, and to our communities. Children are calling each other awful, hurtful names, and they are saying the same things to their teachers and, and other adults. Parents come to schools and curse out the administration and staff without any regrets. The state of disrespect in our country has grown exponentially over the last decade. We in public schools play an important role in this fight for our children. We cannot sit back and allow these types of behaviors to continue. We have to start holding our students accountable for their bad behaviors. We have to model the behaviors we expect to see in our students and make sure they understand our expectations. And we have to start providing the resources necessary to move students to settings where they can become successful. It may mean smaller classes for them or settings that allow for more movement. There are many different ways to address these issues, but ignoring them, these behaviors, is not one of them. Our teachers are concerned for their own safety. Too many of them have been hit, punched, kicked, and threatened by their students. In some instances, they have begun to fear for their own lives. I hope it isn't going to take a horrific event for us to finally address this issue in earnest. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. <coughs> Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Hope Messenger.
Good evening. Happy New Year to everyone. Good evening. Thank you. I would like to start by thanking the board for your commitment to early education and for expanding access to quality pre-K programs. As we've discussed, as um, our priorities and our recommendations to the board to improve the quality of special education for BCPS, what we found in the birth through age five group is that in order to increase the efficiency, we have got to increase the number of hours of therapy available for children in, our, in the youngest group. We know that there's a library full of data that shows us a variety of different models for a variety of different diagnoses that can be met when we increase the number of hours of therapy anywhere from eight hours per week to 40 hours per week depending on the diagnosis and severity. We know that at this age group, there's also an incredible window because of neuroplasticity where we can make dramatic long-term changes when we invest. And when it comes down to the bottom line of what we're going to get on our return for investment, a Chicago longitudinal study showed that for every dollar we invest in early intervention services, we're going to get $10.83 back to society by the time these children are 26. We need to show our children from birth through age five that they are worth our investment and invest the money to increase the number of hours of therapy that are available for a variety of models. Unfortunately, when children are given the gift of an early diagnosis and families receive an early diagnosis, which now can happen um, as, as young as 18 months old, when a family goes to the county to figure out where to begin these intervention services, there are simply not valid models available and there's nowhere to start. So we have to do better. We have to provide classrooms and quality pre-K programs that are going to meet the needs of our special needs children in the community. And in case you would like to take a look at the research that we used to inform this recommendation, I'm going to pass these out to you. And um, I hope that we can provide equitable access to world-class first instruction, which means expanding access to programs that are built on research by increasing the numbers of hours of therapy available to children from birth through five in Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is the leader of CASE, Mr. Bill Lawrence. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dan, Superintendent. Uh, just a few bullet uh, items. Uh, first, uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope you got some rest and relaxation. Uh, you're now embarking on the second and third most important parts of your job, which are the bud both the capital and the operating budget. Uh, also take a moment to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Miller onto the board and to our happy <laughs> little crew here. <laughs> um, uh, as I mentioned a couple of months ago when I was here, we're in the midst of negotiating uh, and expanding the uh, master agreement. Those uh, conversations have been fruitful and um, continue and we look towards a, uh, a positive resolution over the next couple of months. Um, in that budget that you, we talked about a minute ago, um, the superintendent and I talked just today uh, about a new initiative that talks about how we jest and look at evaluating principles. Uh, and it's a very important initiative, one that Montgomery County has taken the national lead in, but something uh, that um, we may not be able to do right away, but in the long term, uh, it's a very important initiative and something uh, that I hope that this board and the superintendent uh, support. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Our next speaker is from AFSME, Mr. Michael Fahey. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Dr. Dance. Um, I'm here tonight because there are persistent violations of the contract between Baltimore County Public Schools and AFSCME Local 434. And some of these issues are um, because uh, not just the contract, but some laws are being broken. Um, start with <clears throat> Article 1, recognition. Supervisors are refusing to recognize our shop stewards as representatives of the employees. We are told constantly, I need to speak to the employee. 
while other supervisors are dealing directly with employees to settle grievances. Article 3, members' protection. Supervisors are engaging in interference and restraint of the shop stewards, uh, particularly last month was the withdrawal of approval to attend negotiations at the last minute. Subcontracting, uh, we are short of drivers because of the aggressive policy of transportation management to, quote, get rid of undesirables. This treatment of older and disabled employees is discrimination and illegal. I failed to get an adequate response to my letter regarding the introduction of the evacuation proficiency test, which is a new condition of employment. Article 7, sick leave. Employees are being required to provide sick note on the first day of illness. Employees are unpaid sometimes after providing sick notes from the doctor. Article 8, discipline and discharge. Employees are being sent home on, quote, administrative leave without pay. There is no due process, no letter, no documentation, and no such language in our contract. Office of Transportation's own discipline procedure manual requires that a form be completed for administrative leave and a letter given to the employee. <coughs> a proper investigation is not being done, and this is circumventing the due process. Article 14, we are being denied access to review our files and our payroll records. Article 17, safety and health. Despite complaints over time, bus lots are not safe or healthy, especially in inclement weather. Buses are not being washed, reducing visibility on the road and increasing the risk of an accident. Article 17, again, the union is not being represented on the board's system-wide safety committee. Article 18, field trip and standby assignments will be made five days in advance. This is not happening. Employees are sometimes given these assignments on the day of the assignment and frequently not able to take breaks. Finally, I would have serious concerns that, that confidential and medical information is not protected and mishandled by unauthorized employees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fahey. Our next speaker for the evening is Anne Constantino. Happy New Year, boys. Happy New Year. Thank you. I've been sick for three weeks, so um. this is time for three minutes, but <laughs> if I have a coughing fit, please excuse me. <clears throat> I would like to read some partial transcripts and summaries regarding discussions from last school year's rollout of STAT. And using what occurred over a period of approximately 35 days, I intend to show you the apparent rapid evolution of STAT success. During last year's budget meeting, Mr. Moniotis asked the superintendent if the budget was subject to the Johns Hopkins study of STAT. The superintendent responded, we are going to be receiving the mid-year report from Johns Hopkins. The goal is you take Johns Hopkins' first year of the study. Later during this meeting, there was a heated exchange. Senator Collins asked to delay the vote until data was available, and he also asked for clarification about whether or not lighthouse schools were in fact performing better than non-lighthouse schools. The superintendent responded, I did not say that lighthouse school students are getting a better education than students in non-lighthouse schools. There is enough qualitative data in talking with parents, principals, teachers. 23 days after this meeting and budget vote, the Johns Hopkins report finally emerged and stated in part the following. While this mid-year report contains early baseline data of the effects of STAT evident in lighthouse schools, it appears that these locations are beginning to transition to technology-enhanced learner-centered environments. But about 14 days later, and the most profound shift with STAT occurred when the superintendent made a presentation at the March 2015 Teaching and Learning Conference in which he was being praised for the unprecedented success of our digital initiative. And despite Johns Hopkins' statement that our results were a baseline beginning transition and that less of 6% of our schools even had STAT because we were in the lighthouse phase, we had somehow catapulted in two weeks' time without a bona fide track record of success to an example of success for the nation. 
facilitator said, congratulations on the success. I want to know, is there a secret to this success because we don't have that kind of success across the United States? So what's your secret? You can read the superintendent's answer in my submission. It seems that here in BCPS, we have a problem with perception versus reality. When this kind of marketing of one school system takes place, when the citizens know that this is not actually what's occurring, it leads to a trust problem because it calls into question why there is a need to paint a certain picture that is not actually rooted in reality. To put it simply, we seem to celebrate way too much and about successes that haven't happened nearly to the level to which they are being celebrated and praised. We are a national example for something that does not yet live up to the way it is being touted across the country, and people in this county know it. Moreover, praise and awards are not substitutes for objective, measurable, quantitative data, nor is it qualitative data, I'm almost done, that I am comfortable trusting when my children will be strapped into this in-flight pilot test. This is an experiment that involves a lot of money in children. Please consider what you are having the school system's children sacrifice in exchange for rushing to market oneself as a national leader of something that is truly in its infancy to date and to date unproven to be effective in education. And finally, there seems to be a significant problem with trustworthiness with this initiative because illusion often trumps the truth of what is actually going on here. I hope that this Board of Education is willing to see this trend and that you have our students' best interest in mind and their educational well-being as the number one priority. This is about education and not about stardom. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Good evening. My apology for my voice. Uh, cold weather has bad effect on health, but also heat has <coughs> bad effect on all of us, especially students. So I would like to focus today about the issue of air conditioners. We are in the middle of winter, but very soon we'll be in summertime, and the AC problems would be an issue. Of course, our youngsters are more affected physiologically than adults to heat. Um, when there is no air conditioner in a school, the students who are afflicted with the respiratory problems, whether it's restrictive or asthmatic in nature, Basically, what will happen, there would be a bronchospasm, there would be a spasm in the airway that will affect their breathing. And the amount of secretions uh, increase, which really compromise the respiratory system uh, more uh, than uh, it can. Um, heat increase metabolic rate. Uh, in the old days, people used to put themselves in heat sauna so they lose weight. So. Basically, when, when that happens, oxygen demands increase and CO2 production uh, increase. And for somebody who has asthma or other similar ailments, that would be quite a stress on their system. Heart rate will go up, and um, urine output usually increase in time, so students may have a little bit more urge for urination. But you, you really don't need a physician to tell you the ill effects of heat on our students, all right? A student cannot really learn unless comfortable, uh, reasonably well fed, and temperature is ambient, reasonable. Um, and I sit in for 11 years now, continuous by next month. I really don't know what the issue about air <coughs> conditioners. Um, there is plenty of money, I hear. Uh, it's diverted in one direction or the other. Um, I ask you as a board to put something like a thermometer on, on the wall, number of schools that has no air conditioners, and each time one is really fixed up, uh, basically you would fill that line or put a check mark or something of that sort so we can really see the progress. And I ask you to make a ti timetable. When do we expect that really all our schools to be really qualified with air conditioners? Um, so 
that's my uh, spiel for today. I hope you would uh, um, have a, a better year and productive year. And Dr. Dance, I really like your beard. Uh, shows maturity. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Our next speaker is Ms. Joanne Simpson. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. <coughs> Don't start yet. Oh, God. OK. <laughs> I'm a BPS parent, BCPS parent, and I urge you to slow down and reconsider STAT. BCPS is slated to provide laptops K through 7 next year at 37.5 million, now projected to be $600,000 higher. The STAT $205 million cost we've heard about is actually a projected $272.1 million. That's $70 million more. We seem to be facing a financial debacle in the making. Since first proposed here, problem-plagued one-to-one laptop programs have caused ballooning costs or other disasters in similar large school districts nationwide. The elephant in the room, how will BCPS find hundreds of millions to pursue this large tech ed experiment with increasingly questionable outcomes? Once set up, we'd face expensive leasing and software costs in perpetuity. Despite assurances to the contrary, many problems found in Fort Bend, Texas, Huntsville, Alabama, Hoboken, New Jersey, Miami-Dade, Florida, and elsewhere are already plaguing the initiative here. <coughs> I've sent you various links. School districts that claim some success with one-to-one -one are also usually very small at 5,000 or 9,000 students total or have class sizes of only 13. Any initiative is easier to handle under such circumstances. It's like doing a program in five or so Baltimore schools, Baltimore County schools and claiming a national tech ed milestone. We are a district of 111,000 students. We have numerous class sizes of nearly 30. Many sixth grade teachers here can barely monitor what students are doing online on the pilot laptops, including bypassing firewalls to surf YouTube, play ESPN arcade games, and download Snapchat instead of learning, a problem that signaled the downfall of the notoriously disastrous Los Angeles program. That's partly because this large-scale digital approach is a big experiment with our children as subjects. Tech has its place in schools, but laptops or tablets, when highly used, often impede learning due to digital distractions and other issues, as numerous studies show. These programs have repeatedly been abandoned by school districts because of rising costs. Others have had some minor success. Again, they're usually smaller. It's misguided to say this is a wave of the future. The question is whether it's working now for the young lives in our care. Even the vaunted yet tiny Mooresville School District, which Dr. Dance refers to as a model, does not give each student a device in K through second. BCPS already does in first through third. These children are increasingly glued to screens despite growing evidence this is detrimental, especially to our littlest learners who should be conversing, making eye contact, and building tactile interactions, though the same goes for all learners. Now BCPS wants to put five-year-olds on devices. You are digitizing our children and we have no real say. Tech and online access can work wonderfully if appropriate with time off and time on. Some <coughs> teachers here worried how they're perceived are following this digital learning environment fully. The one-to-one -one approach seems central to the problem since students more likely hack a computer the school system gives them, instruction is less balanced because of over-reliance on the devices, and costs prove unwieldy. I can provide sources and would be happy to speak with anyone interested in avoiding a financial boondoggle and negative outcomes for our children. Please halt further massive funding of STAT. The contract is not binding. Pull back from one to one and consider making devices or access available, not assigned, and delay expansion. Take more time to rigorously vet the tech tools and pilot with an objective eye to see what works and what clearly does not. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Garrison McLaney. Good evening, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm here to present my personal experience with the hasty initiation or implementation of the one-to-one -one technology initiative in hopes of slowing down or stopping its implementation until such time that there would be sufficient proof of, ef of efficacy. My, my daughter is a bright sixth grade student at a lighthouse middle school. She's in several GT classes, a few of which I attended during American Education Week. Unfortunately, I was not impressed by what I saw. 
Her GT World Cultures class, taught by a department head, a young but seasoned teacher, suggested students explore the Amazon to get ideas about where their interests lie. She also suggested that they may want to use links to Baltimore County licensed digital content as a jumping off place. Well, they jumped right into some random site about llamas. They never made it to the Amazon. And this was with myself and her, two of her grandparents in, in the classroom. So I can only imagine what my daughter's doing when we're not there um, in a large, large class, um, as has already been mentioned. Unfortunately, the resulting unit of study never did engage my daughter. She didn't learn about the Amazon or any world cultures, could barely identify the objective of the unit, and her final essay did not inform beyond a second grade level but received full credit. Um, in her GT language arts, um, class, uh, a teacher with a great reputation at the school, well liked by students and parents, presented a warm up which turned into a total distraction where only about five students out of 30 were engaged in the lesson. Um, to this teacher's defense, he just doesn't have the training or support for how to implement the technology uh, appropriately. Um, there were times when the students were actually taking pictures of each other and these were being um, broadcast up on the, the overhead. Um, so here's my daughter's experience with technology so far this year, but please don't tell her I told you or she will stop feeding me information. <laughs> She's a people person. She's always needed to connect with the teacher, which is very common. It's human nature. Now, in addition to all of the other distractions in classrooms, she's, get, she's got a device literally between her and her teacher as the teacher tries to teach. She wants teachers, not devices. She thinks that the teachers don't care what she does as long as she's quiet and busy. Um, she's, uh, she's told my, my son, her fourth grade brother, who expects he'll be getting a device next year, that she'll teach him how to find all the games. She's also shown me a long um, running digital note that she passes back and forth with her, st with her friends in other classrooms that have, among other things, many, many pictures of Donald Trump and various farm animals. So unfortunately, um, in addition, she's getting all up to date on the current pop music, which is not a problem to me, but uh, I'd rather she not spend her school time doing that. So her time is valuable, as is yours. I appreciate you hearing her story tonight, and watch out for weapons of mass distraction. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Alexis Drisco. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Alexis and I am a fifth grade student at Kingsville Elementary. Kingsville does not currently have air conditioning. <coughs> I am here today to talk about what it feels like to try and learn in the hot conditions. It makes me feel tired, emotional, uncomfortable, <coughs> and very sweaty. I left school and couldn't wait to start fifth grade, but when it is so hot, I watch the clock waiting for the bell to ring and for school to be over. Even though I love summer, I find myself wishing for cold weather. It is hard to learn in a hot classroom and very hard to perform my best on tests. Last year, when we took the park reading test in the spring, our classroom was very hot. We had to keep the lights hot, which made the room even hotter. My scores are going to be compared to other students who took the test in comfortable classrooms. That doesn't seem fair. We are taking a standardized test, but how is it standardized if some students are taking it in the comfort of air conditioning, while others are taking the exam in the heat? It's hard to concentrate and give my best effort when I am so uncomfortable, and sweat drips off my face onto my, and onto my paper. This is true for grades too. My classroom is are very hot for at least three months of the year, but I still have to perform well on tests, quizzes, and assignments, all while I am struggling to concentrate and stay awake. I feel like I can't learn when the classroom is so hot. My brain just can't focus. English language arts is one of my hardest subjects, and it is at the end of the day. After sitting in the heat all day, I really can't focus and struggle to follow the lesson, even though I know it is really important. I'm very lucky because I don't have any serious medical issues. The heat just makes me really uncomfortable and makes it hard for me to concentrate. But for some of my friends, the heat causes physical pain and stress. Some of my classmates complain of bad headaches. Some throw up at school. Some can't eat lunch because they feel so sick. Some even pass out. One of my good friends has always had asthma and the heat makes her asthma attacks much worse. She also has ADD and the heat makes it even harder for her to concentrate, especially in ELA at the end of the day. 
Finally, she has connective tissue disorder. Our classroom temperatures are often 90 degrees or higher. This is really hard on her. She is completely exhausted. Her body can't recover as fast as most of us. We are 10 year olds. We should have a lot of energy all day long. We should be able to concentrate in school and enjoy learning. And we should have energy to do homework and play after school. But we can't do any of this when we are in the heat all day long. I challenge anyone who thinks it's okay for us to wait six more years to finally get air conditioning to come sp spend a day with us next June, or even better, try to do your jobs without air conditioning for a whole day. I bet you'll agree that six days is way too long to wait, and asking us to wait several years is just wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice report. Um, our last speaker for the evening is Charlene Benke. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and our board members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I am Charlene Benke, Principal of Vincent Farm Elementary School, and with me this evening are LaTanya Belzer and Heather Denmeyer, two of our wonderful assistant principals. If they please stand up. Um, the three of us bring to you a combined 64 years of experience in education, and we are, are also all three parents. As I watch the board meetings every two weeks from my couch at home, I know that you often hear from our BCPS stakeholders about areas that need correction, buildings that need renovations, and a vast array of issues that need addressing. However, you don't often hear about some of the great things that are going on in our schools. The board and the superintendent are often not given the opportunity to be thanked for the programs and initiatives that are making a difference in students' lives. Under Dr. Dance's leadership, we have tackled what has been called transformational change to teaching and learning. Perhaps the biggest, and in my view, the greatest change that has been occurring is that we are truly redefining the role of our students in our school system. No longer are students arriving at our doorstep ready for teachers to fill their minds with information. We have begun the change necessary to make the student the center of instruction and a part of their own learning. Our students now partner with the teacher to be sure that they know what's expected to learn and then they monitor their progress towards that learning. The creation of the student-led classroom does take time, but once students are engaged at that level in their learning, we have seen a reduction in behavior concerns in the classroom and a level of excitement in our school building that is contagious. The last two years, I have seen a level of instruction provided to students unlike anything I have seen in as of July this year, 25 years in teaching. The support from our stat teacher has been tremendous in bringing Vincent Farm to this level, and we are appreciative and excited that this program will continue to help influence our students to an even greater degree. Vincent Farm students also benefit because we are a part of the Passport program. Currently, our fourth and fifth graders have Spanish every week, this is a blended model taught online and with a Spanish-speaking teacher. It is motivating for students, and the interest in learning a language other than English has spread to other grade levels in our building. My own children attended Baltimore County Public Schools. They were not offered this opportunity, and I can only imagine how successful they might have been. We appreciate having the opportunity to share with you some of the successes we are seeing the past few years and how the vision of our superintendent is unfolding for students. The work of teachers has never been easy. The goal of transforming teaching and learning is definitely not a small one, but with a consistent focus and small steps toward the goal of creating learning environments for the 21st century learner, we are well on our way at Vincent Farm Elementary. Thank you for all you're doing for Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is old business, and um, we have some policies up for third reading. I'll turn that over to Ms. Williams. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Good evening, Mr. Chairman and everyone in attendance, and 
fellow board members, Superintendent Dance. The Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendations to amend board policies 3000, 3126, 3127, 8260, and 8366 presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit H. The only comments received on these policies were those made during the public comment period at the December 1, 2015 board meeting. Uh, staff is available should board members have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee, com um, committee at this time? Can I, so moved. can I move that they are separated to discuss certain ones separately? Um, <coughs> Which one would you like to discuss separately? I had a question about policy 3126. Did anyone else have any questions they wanted to pull one out? All right. Yeah, you may go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. <clears throat> Under the uh, 3126, it has the phrase, the approved uh, services and travel. Who does the approval? And how is that approval known? The approved expenses are uh, itemized in the procedures, but they are any expense that is incurred uh, in the course of conducting business for the board, such as a mileage reimbursement, um, the purchase of supplies that are used at a meeting or in a classroom that are undertaken by uh, an employee, a teacher, an administrator. So when, when, it, when the language says approved, it would indicate that there is, that someone has done the approval. The supervisor so of whomever is incurring the expense, whether that be a, uh, a department uh, chair or a principal for a teacher, an assistant superintendent for a principal, uh, the superintendent for the chief of staff. So there is a detailed list of approvals that the superintendent issues every July that itemizes who approves what uh, for which employees uh, that are incurring expenses. Okay, so the policy then is somewhat vague, attributing a lot of uh, flexibility to the superintendent when he comes out with that July approval list. So it's tied to the superintendent's it, Well, the approval approvals list. are tied there, the expenses are, uh, examples are provided in the associated procedures and in the uh, accounting manual that are all posted to the website and uh, are, are the means by which uh, the superintendent implements this policy as it says in Roman numeral two. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, I'd like to pull out policy 5000. Is that, is that at this time? That's no. not up today okay. for, thank you. Um, Ms. Causey, were there any other questions related to the ones that are being voted on for third reading? No. Okay. Um, I don't remember if we had a, a motion. I'm going to ask again if we, I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee this time. So moved. You don't need a second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams. <coughs> Our uh, next agenda item is old business, the uh, fiscal year 2017 county capital budget. Uh, Mr. Saris and Mr. Smith. It's 
Yes. Chairman McDaniel, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Danson, board members. Um, I'm joined by Mr. George Saris and Mr. Pete Dixit to uh, bring to you again the um, county capital plan that has been brought forward to you at the last meeting and to address any questions that you may have had and submitted to us. We've, we've given you a revised copy with some of the um, additional information that was requested by the board. Um, in addition to that, from that time, there has been um, further approval from the state as it relates to what our allocations are, which are listed there. Before it was about $17.9 million. Now that, which has transpired since our last meeting, has, has increased to about $28.8 million. Um, the pro, the projects that have been listed before have not changed. They're the same projects that we've had at the last uh, presentation that we brought to you. And this time I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Dixit to go over those projects briefly again and then take any questions that you may have. Good evening. Uh, some of the new uh, approvals that you have received are in the column recommend state recommendation on 12-21-15. That's blue. Uh, that's shaded blue. This shows uh, the additional recommendation that we have received uh, uh, since the last meeting. Additional recommended amounts that we have received since the last meeting. Do you have any questions on that? Yeah, Mr. Dixon, what are you looking at? What I have isn't blue at all. <laughs> Thanks, I can Blue. Give you a yeah. copy. Yeah, okay. Steve, you have one at your, at your desk. <laughs> I have Miss Clausey. Keep going. Keep going. No, you in that packet. You, in the packet, just on, on paper, clip it. We just received that today, Steve. So the board did receive a revised email from me today based on input that board members wanted us to include. The projects are, in fact, still the same. The dollar amounts are still the same, but we did want to comply with some board member requests. They wanted some additional information. So that's why we have hard copies in front of you, and we was emailed out to you this afternoon. Mr. Dixit, this is the same as what's on board docs as the as the attachment. It's just the attachment on board docs doesn't have the blue in it. Is that correct? This it, one has been updated. It's not the same as the one on board docs. It is not the one is the same as on board docs. Uh, the one that's on board docs was submitted prior to the winter break, and during during the winter break, uh, we've got a further allocation from the state that brings the 17.9 million dollars that was on the document on on board docs to 28 million. The projects didn't change. The, the phases of when the IAC funds us, we just got another round of that funding that, that transpired during the submission deadline for board docs, and we wanted you to have the most recent information, so we, br so we brought in a hard copy, and the superintendent sent you uh, an electronic copy as well earlier today. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right. Are there any questions for the gentleman, uh, Ms. Causey? Can you explain uh, why there are no state uh, funds approved yet for all of these uh, renovations for Patapsco High, Lansdowne High, Woodlawn High, and Delaney High? Uh, we have requested, if you look at the first year of the request, there's about million twenty, million twenty that we have requested, and the superintendent is going to appeal when he goes to Annapolis in January, at the end of the January, and that'll be part of our appeal. So does that mean that they denied it and you have to appeal no, it, or they is, just no, deferred it? This is a continuous process. Part of the funding was received in the first shot, which was eighteen million, seventeen million dollars. We appealed. Superintendent went to the IAC, and as a result of that appeal, we, we have received additional $28 million. There is one more final appeal that's going to be in Annapolis in January, 27th of January. And uh, we are hopeful that we'll be able to get the $1 million for all of the high schools that we have listed here. When you, make, when you say the word appeal, would it be more accurate to say request? 
Well, is it, it an is appeal process? It is officially called as an appeal, yeah. but it amounts to additional request. request. Right. Okay. It is the, it's, it's the phasing of yeah. when the allocations come to the LEAs. Yeah. So the first allocation, which was the 17 million, happened prior to the, the last submission. The, the second phasing of the allocation, which is called the appeal, um, per the state's definition, we got that allocation during the winter break, and then there's typically additional rounds, another round that will come subsequent to the January 27th um, final appeal from all of the um, from all of the LEAs at that time. So this is this is not inconsistent with it. Prior past years, it is very inconsistent with that. The, the slight distance difference that we have now, the first allocation and the second allocation has been slightly higher than prior years. So we can only surmise that that's a good thing because we've, we've gotten a little bit more in each of those intervals related to where we are now in the process, but we're still at the, we're at the right place in the process from, from past years. Just to add to what Mr. Smith said, last year we had received 17.8 million after the second round. This year we have received 28.8 million. So it is we and are that's, doing much better. And that's 28 in total. So I don't want you to think it's 17 and 28. It's 17 and then the allocation went up to as much as 18, I mean 28 million now. So it's a total of 28 million for those two allocations. Okay, is any delay on the uh, Patapsco High, Lansdowne High, Woodlawn High, and Delaney High related to uh, the IAC waiting for the final feasibility study? No, we still have till April the 1st to provide additional information. We are in the final stages of feasibility and we have a continuous dialogue with the IAC. Okay, and then one final question. I noticed um, we asked for state funding fiscal year 2017 for $59 million, and we expect to get 39 or so of that. <clears throat> and um, we have what they've approved so far with one, two, three, four. You know, someone can add that up, 12, $13 million for air conditioning projects. Um, next year, the state funding request, as I see in this column, is already at $64 million, and that does not include any new air conditioning project. So does that mean that next year the county capital budget will not include, the, the state funding request will not include any new air conditioning projects? No, it does no, not no, mean that. We are still going to request air conditioning projects. Correct. But it's just less feasible that we're going to get money because we're already requesting $64 million that we know we're not going to get. So if we request additional monies for window air conditioning, based on past trends, um, it just seems like the next level, the next round of air conditioning projects might not get done. Well, we don't really know at this point, so any, any discussion on that is premature. Sometimes county provides additional funding if they have available funds. So it's, it, it, it's, it's premature to say that we will or we will not get funds for air conditioning. But it is, it is not the intent of this capital plan for FY17. We can't necessarily speak for FY18 because we're not there yet, that those projects, those projects that have been slated for 18 thus far related to the air condition projects would not move forward. So if, that, so if there's board members for whom it's unacceptable that our students continue to suffer in the heat and our teachers continue to suffer in the heat, that in fact we should be looking at another option to make sure that our children don't suffer, as Dr. Bosch Verone said, particularly the, our little people with the excess heat. So that would be a fair statement to make. I would just ask my fellow board members, how many years do you think it is acceptable for our students to sit in excess heat when they have no guarantee of when they're going to get air conditioning? Are there other questions for our panel? Yeah, I've got some questions. Go ahead, Mr. Virch. Um, 
First, um, you know, there's a lot of ongoing projects, and there's a number of them in um, our sixth district. That's the district that I represent, but it's our district, really. Uh, you have them at Chase, and we're doing air conditioning at Villa Cresta and Hawthorne, and Overly has an extensive renovation that's going to extend. And uh, obviously, the funding for that has to come from someplace, and that's come from a very munific munificent uh, county executive and a very munificent county council. And I know there's a couple other schools in the pipeline for air conditioning in, in our district, our sixth district. That's Oakley, and that's Victory Villa. But you know, there's also a, a large number of um, free and reduced meal um, student populations in the 6th District in various schools. And a number of those schools don't have air conditioning. And I took a look at, at this current proposed with the blue, and um, I mean, in terms of air conditioning for Orms Elementary School that has a 54% a um, free and reduced uh, meal student population, there's nothing on this list for Orms Elementary School. Is that correct? Correct. And um, there hasn't even been any capital budget funding for air conditioning for Orms Elementary School that's been requested. Is that correct? That is correct. And in the current new budget, the, um, the 2017 operating budget, there's nothing for Orms Elementary School notwithstanding its uh, large um, uh, frame reduced uh, meal student population for even temporary air conditioning at Orms Elementary budget. School. Isn't, isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. And when I look at like Middle River Middle School, where I was on August 24th, and as I just said to uh, some folks from Middle River Middle School, there was, and you were there, and there wasn't a dry hand in that school on that day, and I do, and I've commended you for the work you did uh, personally calling in a broken lock, but the fact is there's nothing for Middle River Middle School on this list of capital budget projects. Is that correct? That is correct. That's and correct. it's not even, there hasn't even been any funding requested from Middle River Middle School, notwithstanding how hot it was on the first day of school. It hasn't even been requested. Is that right? Correct. In, this, and, in, in the FY17 capital. Exactly. Budgets. Yes, sir. And in the and in the 2017 operating budget, there still isn't any money, even for temporary air conditioning, for for Middle River Middle School. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. And when I look at Golden Ring Middle School, which has a 72 percent free and reduced meal student population, they're not on this chart. And there's, there hasn't even been requested any funding for that school for air conditioning. And, you know, there, there isn't even any temporary air conditioning. There's no relief coming to these students. You don't have to, that's not a question, that's just a statement. But what I'm getting to is that there's three other schools that serve students from the 6th District. Uh, Kenwood High School, Stemmers Run Middle School, the Rosedale Center. The Rosedale Center has 25% uh, of its student population are, are special education students. And when we hear the parents and their children come and speak to us about these schools, it's, it's difficult to say to them, you're not going to be getting any air conditioning. And not only that, it hasn't been requested. Now, as I said, we have a very munificent county executive, a very munificent county council, but I was there and so were you. And so was the superintendent and other members of this board. If we if we if we keep doing things the same way, we're not going to change anything that we do. And I know you made a very uh, informative presentation to the policy review committee. Uh, we've shared that with other members of uh, the board at large. I want to thank you for your efforts and the research you've done on the temporary uh, air conditioning concept. I know it hasn't been embraced as we speak now, but. Those schools are not going to get any cooler come the late spring, and we're going to be starting school another two weeks early. Well, let me go this way. We're starting school at approximately the same date, and maybe a couple of days later, and it's going to be just as hot in August in Middle River Middle School. And while I know you'll be going where you need to be, but I invite you to meet me next school year at Middle River Middle School. We'll check the locks, and we'll see just how, just how the air conditioning, what the air conditioning needs are of that school. Anyway, I thank you for coming. I appreciate you being patient and listening to me, but that school is a very, very hot school, as is Kenwood High School and a number of other ones, and they don't get any cooler as they get older. Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me make those remarks. All right. Um, Ms. Johnson. And, oh, 
Yeah, so air conditioning is one of the many issues, and this I'm, I didn't, I haven't heard a lot of questions, some just rhetorical questions, so I'm going to ask rhetorical questions of my fellow board members. Air conditioning is one of the issues we have throughout the county, or lack thereof. Um, but we also have lack of adequate supplies, lack of adequate support staff, and staff, um, true and not su superficial support of our subgroups, 66 to 1 student teacher ratios for ESOL classes, deteriorating facilities, deteriorating facilities, deteriorating f facilities, um, fair distribution of funds to our farm schools, uh, true stu student centered learning for. Uh, for our students with capable teachers, uh, clean drinking water, deterioration of our facilities, safe bus rides, safe schools, equal access to college prep, true and accurate lessons in African American history, safe schools, facilities, deteriorating facilities. So while portable air conditioning is a fix to one of these many things, I asked my fellow board members, are we just going to fix one thing in the short term, or are we going to create a comprehensive plan that is going to take us forward past 2019, past 2021, for my children and my children's children and my children's children? So that's the question I ask rhetorically to our board members. Well, I have an answer to that, Marisol. I'm really glad you asked. And I, I sent an email around. I sent an email around to every board member, and if we could just get a little shot of this, then uh, the audience and upside down, upside down, <laughs> upside down show. Thank you, thank you so much. Obviously, I'm not used to being up here with with props this time, uh, because this has been given to every board member. It was emailed and staff and so forth. And what it is is it's a it's a discussion piece, and it's a spreadsheet that lays out the cost uh, to cool each classroom that's currently uncooled using window air conditioning. This, the numbers in this column were created by the Department of General Services under the direction of the Interagency Committee on School Construction, which is chaired by Dr. David Lever. These numbers are from uh, the uh, county capital request that relate to just air conditioning projects, not clean water, not renovations, and so forth. This number includes, as my board members have been informed, the electrical upgrades that are necessary to put in the window air conditioning units. And what the DGS, the Department of General Services, found is that these schools need electrical upgrades anyway. We're talking about expanding digital devices into schools that have not had their electricity upgraded. So I don't know what that means for fuses blowing or electrical fires or just equipment not working or not being available. Um, so what one of the things that using a combination, a blended cooling model, if you will, a student-centered cooling model, one of the things that can do for us is it can provide an equitable solution for every student and teacher in the county in the short term while pulling back millions of dollars in the near term to do some of these things, like a replacement school for Dundalk Elementary mm -hmm. or uh, addition that will still be needed at Johnny Cake Elementary School, which will still be 120% capacity, although they're getting three new schools in that area. Um, and Reisterstown Elementary School, as we know, is desperate need of uh, addition and additional bathrooms and so forth because they're overcrowded to such an extent that the teachers are teaching in closets. And I, I commend that principal for using every square inch to the best of her ability. And despite having the portable classrooms deposited there by our facilities, it's still in a very desperate situation. So what I would recommend is that the board review the operating budget and at the policy review committee, we can discuss perhaps how we can actually solve this problem once and for all that Anne Arundel County s solved 12 years ago. They stand ready to help us just as they help Prince George's County with design plans and so forth. And, and uh, like Steve, I'll thank Kevin Smith for going down to Anne Arundel and understanding how they were able to do that. And that will give us the time we need to develop a comprehensive plan for our facilities because we won't have children fainting, we won't have children being taken to the hospital in ambulances and having asthma attacks and so forth. So I'm glad you asked the question because the board does have an opportunity to look at what real solutions are, to do what we are 
sworn to do, which is to provide a fair and effective education for each student in this county. Um, and to follow up on Ms. Kazi's uh, point, now, uh, can you tell us at the end of the physical, fiscal year 17 how many schools will be without air conditioning? Uh, Six, according to 16. We'll have 16 at the end. Being remaining after that time. Without funding. That, without funding. Right. So funding is not done. Funding is potentially two to three years away from actually being cool and safe. How many schools will we have completed the work to air condition by the end of next year? I guess it was a question that I was. We'll, we'll have to get that for you. I mean, okay. when, when it has to be a, it has to be a time period. They're done at different phases, so we're not doing all of the schools that we have at one point in time. So, if from now it may be in April, we may have some done. We may have some others done at the end of the summer. So it's not. It's not at one specific date. Well, okay. we just, well, the chairman just picked one, Kevin, for God's sake. He said at the end of the school year, I think he said, pick a date and, and tell us how many schools are done at that date. We know we're not going to stop working. We're working constantly. But you can get us an answer of how many schools involving how many children are not having air conditioning. The chairman said at the end of next school year. Next school year. So that would be make it June 30th of 2017. How many are going to be done then? How many are not? How many kids are going to be not having air conditioning? That's a simple question. Let, let, me, let me try. Let oh, me. Oh, 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 oh. Some are being Mr. done Chair, constantly. We will provide that information for you. We don't have it at this particular time. That's we will provide it at that date. I was trying to get clarity as to when he wanted the time frame. That's no problem. We can provide that information to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah, and how Johnson. many schools before our superintendent was superintendent had air conditioning? When I arrived here, 74 schools did not have air conditioning. And if I may offer a word, and, and I understand it's a heated discussion now, and <laughs> since I've been here, this has been a heated discussion. This is not a, an issue that, precede, that, that's not, that did not precede me. But if I can just offer a, a little perspective here. Again, if you think back to 2012, and board members, you have this in the letter that I responded to Dr. Lever. 74 schools did not have air conditioning. I'm not politicizing this saying back into 2010. In 2012, when this board hired me, and yes, this board, because I still work for the Board of Education, 74 schools did not have air conditioning. With our state and county capital requests that stand before you tonight, we will be down to 16 schools that will not be funded for air conditioning. Now, to the point that I think with Chuck, you were, um, Mr. Chair McDaniels, you were talking about, in August of 2017, all of the projects, if you look from Baltimore Highlands down to Grange Elementary School, by August of 2017, they will have air conditioning except for Franklin Middle School. Of course, it's easier to do an elementary air conditioning project as opposed to a middle school or a high school because it takes longer. To Mr. Virch's point around Middle River, Golden Ring, um, in my letter to Dr. Lever, which I've shared with the board and I've shared with the county, out of the 16 schools that are remaining, Golden Ring and uh, Middle River will be included on my FY18 state and county capital request. So the schools that will be listed on the 19 capital requests are schools where we'll be looking at either additions or replacements, but there are schools that are bigger than the conversation of just air conditioning. So with the capital request we have in front of you tonight, if the board approves this, we will actually be allocating or requesting funding from the state and the county for all of our schools to have central air conditioning except for 16. Thank you. <clears throat> which, <clears throat> which is an interesting commentary, uh, but it doesn't answer the question. <clears throat> Maybe I didn't understand the question, Ms. Collins. I'm sorry. No, the, the question is simple. I don't, uh, that how many, how many schools are n are going to be air conditioned are not going to be air conditioned at June 30th of 2017 and how many students attend those schools that was what the chairman asked I think I think that's still the question he's asking I'm not sure yes and, uh, and we don't know that now but we're going to find out and, and, and what I and would offer is that we I can tell you that 20 schools <clears throat> would not have air conditioning in August of 2017 be completed installed in our Friday update to the board we will have the number of students as I don't have that tonight and all except 20 schools in the county. Yes, and the will, reason why that's 16 will be completely, completely air conditioned at the end of 20, end of 2017. August 2017. How many are there now that are not here in 2015? 48 are not air conditioned. 48. 
we're going to get that many air conditioned. Um, and there will be 10 more that will be air conditioned between now and the next school year opening. Say that again. There are 10 more that's going to be completed between now and the next August. Between now and next August. Very good. Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman, yes, if I uh, have the floor. Mr. Collins, yes. Thank you. Uh, I do want to compliment uh, the amount of dollars that the county executive has allocated to this and that the uh, state government has allocated to this over the last many years. They continue to aggressively pursue this uh, cause. Uh, in the interest of not prolonging this too long because of my friend Mr. Stewart who'd like to get home for a real good reason, <laughs> I won't again ask you all of the dates of when the schools were, were started as compared with Kenwood, which is, uh, which is uh, always uh, not discussed or considered because of um, political reasons. Uh, this is, as frustrating as it may sound, a political document. The decisions as to what schools get air conditioned and when they get air conditioned is a political decision. And that's too bad, but that's the reality. And in a way, I guess those that have the, the money and are dispensing it can decide where it goes. Uh, I believe that we are <coughs> complicit in that by not protesting and not arguing for a fair and equitable way of making these decisions. But the fact of the matter is, once again, I'm going to support this capital budget because some people are getting air conditioning. With the clear understanding of the public that I represent, which is the whole county because I'm an at-large member, that if you're on the list, consider yourself among the politically blessed. And if you're not, consider yourself like the rest of us. I would suggest perhaps you look at uh, election returns or some such thing if I want to be completely callous as to where votes came from and have come from in the last few county executive elections and county council elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, given the uh, superintendent's generous offer to provide this information in Friday's weekly update, I'd move that we uh, delay voting on this capital budget tonight and that we vote on it at the next meeting pending the production of that information in the weekly update. I second that. Well, um, let's take your motion. Uh, it's, uh, we've made a motion and uh, a second. Uh, how, well, let's vote on that motion then. I have one uh, more question for Dr. Dance related to the uh, number of schools that remain without air conditioning. It's a short question. We have, a, well, we have this motion. Let's it, it, address, address the motion. We have to address the Okay, thank you. Um, um, I'm sorry, would you state your motion again, Mr. Virch, just for clarity? Sure. Um, certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, given the superintendent's generous offer to provide the information that a number of uh, board members have uh, requested with regard to the number of schools and at what date that will be air conditioned, I ask that we, my move, that we delay vote on this capital budget um, until the next board meeting, giving the superintendent the time that he has indicated he can produce the information. Um, okay, is there some dis any discussion about, about the like uh, motion? The information that was requested has nothing really to do with this capital budget. Irrespective of how many students, what I understand is you, you're going to get a number of X amount of students at the end of 2000, August 2017. No, it was June, school, but that's all right. I heard August, excuse mm -hmm. me. Someone said August 31st. You're going to get a number, uh, a number of, of students in those schools that will not be air conditioned. I don't see any relevance to this capital budget. All right. uh, and and one other thing is that my understanding is that um, the superintendent will be going to Annapolis for the IC to request additional funds, whether it's an appeal or additional request. Uh, I, I don't want the delay in approving this to affect his appearance, <coughs> which it could well do. Mr. Chairman, it's a fair question that, um, that Mr. Uelfelter asks. Uh, what day will the superintendent be going to the IEC? So I'll be going to the IEC, or I should say the Board of Public Works on January the 27th. Um, what I whispered to the chair and I'll say it to the board, um, I can provide tonight in terms of when those schools will be fully 
air condition if we received our state and our county request that's in front of the board. The only additional information I do not have is the number of students. So I would respectfully ask the board if what information additionally other than the number of students would you need in order to approve the administration's request to be sent over to the county? Well, as I, as I see it, we've got uh, another board meeting on the 19th. Is that, is that accurate? It is. We have another board meeting on the 19th. Again, I just will respectfully ask what additional information you would need that okay. might change your decision on whether to approve this capital budget uh, within that two-week period. Okay. Well, we do have a, uh, any any other questions regarding the motion that's on the floor? Yeah. Can we? Uh, yes, Mr. Powell. I just have one. Uh, Mr. Yulfelder, uh, I was the one in following up on what the uh, chairman said, who said uh, we want to know in June. Uh, the superintendent said in August, <coughs> the superintendent's not a member of the board. Um, either way is fine with me, but uh, I said uh, um, June. I think the chairman said June as well. It's a minor point, but uh, I didn't want to break the, break the karma between you and I of agreeing this evening on several items, so I thought I'd better <laughs> add that. All right. So again, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? Mr. Chair, yes. the, the student member, with all due respect, does not vote on this issue because it relates to capital budget. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Nussbaum. <laughs> all right. Uh, all those in favor of Mr. Virch's motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed? Okay. So the. Um, Thank you. So I think we're. I abstain. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Powell. So we had. Uh, did, did we get the uh, vote correct? You didn't get seven. Well, I have Birch, Crosby, and Miller. Four. Yeah. They voted. They voted four. Four. Yeah, I'm sorry. Four of them. And then Mr. Collins abstained. Correct. And then the rest. Were a. She didn't vote. I think she didn't. Right. All right. But it's not to say that that information is not going to be provided. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I'll or, be providing Friday's weekly update. <coughs> okay. Well, then I'll, I'll ask for a motion to adopt the physical year 2017 county capital budget request. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. I, all in favor, I'd like to yeah, Excuse me. And again, Mr. Chairman, the student member, board member does not vote on this issue. Thank you. All in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that uh, clear? Those opposed? Do you want to take a voice vote? She's looking as if she didn't get it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Could you do a vote roll call then and we'll. Opposed. Yes. Ms. Eaton? Yes. Mr. Gillis? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. McDaniels? Yes. Ms. Miller? Nay. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Yulfelder? Yes. Mr. Birch? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say that I'm not against the projects that are in here. What I'm against is us being, as our uh, Senator Collins said, uh, complicit in the fact that the board does have the responsibility and the authority to ask for the funds that it feels are appropriate to take care of the needs of our children. And we still, as a board, have the opportunity to do that through the operating budget where we could very easily take care of our students' health and give them an equitable learning environment by using window air conditioning units. And I would hope that the board can really look through the documents that were sent to you that were developed by the Department of General Services and the IAC um, that really reflect how we can help our students and our teachers. Thank you. And Ms. Kazi, I would thank you for those comments and also thank you for being an advocate for our students and getting cooling in the schools. So thank you. So gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, we can move on to our next item. And um, we're on to uh, 
Personnel matters. Dr. Mayer. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Okay, do I have any discussion on these items? Uh, if not, uh, do I have a motion to approve oh, exhibits? I, I wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Ms. Dombrowski from Church Lane, I just wanted to um, mention that I have had the pleasure of being in her classroom a handful of times during um, uh, career week, and um, she will be missed by, I'm sure, the, the students and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Yes, Mr. Collins. Uh, in my in my Happy New Year wishes to the audience, I, I had the pleasure of speaking with the folks from Vincent Farm uh, and the uh, folks from Middle River, uh, and um, I just want to give a shout out to them because both of those schools were uh, in my district when I was in the legislature, and I visited uh, both of them on more than one occasion, and I know we're, we're uh, advancing the assistant principal at Middle River and I already thanked her for working in, in my old neighborhood uh, that I represented, and uh, I know she'll do a fine job. And um, I just wanted to say that because I chatted with those folks out in the audience um, when I was saying hello to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Um, do I have a motion to approve exhibits J1 through J4? So moved. Um, all in favor, please say. Uh, I need a second, I'm sorry. Second. I've got a second from Mr. Gillis. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Mr. Mayo. I do have one question. Dr. Mayo? For Dr. Mayo. Uh, when does our transportation director start? Say it again. When does our transportation director start? Start on December 21st. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <coughs> administrative appointments there next. Yes, Thanks. Chairman McDaniels and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal at Middle River Middle School and Coordinator of Related Services in the Office of Special Education. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit K? So moved. I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, we'd like to introduce the new assistant principal at Middle River Middle School, but currently the acting assistant principal at Middle River Middle School, and that's Christy Allen. <laughs> Ms. Allen, I know you're next to Shannon Parker, who's very, very excited to <laughs> take the acting off your title. Do you have any other family or friends who are with you this evening? Congratulations on your new role. <laughs> Congratulations again. Next is for the coordinator of related services in the Office of Special Education, and currently right now, a special social worker in the Education Related Services Department, and that's Patricia Mustafer. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations to you. Do you have any family or friends here with you besides Rebecca Ryder? <laughs> Good, big guys. Good seeing both of you again. <laughs> Yeah, that concludes the administrative appointments. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, our next item is new business action taken in closed session. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered an appeal regarding a confidential employee uh, or student matter. Uh, this was a considered on the record. This was a student matter, actually. It was considered on the record as no request for oral argument was made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action that the Board took in closed session in that matter, which was hearing examiner number 16-29. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. One abstention. Oh, one abstention. abstention. Ms. Causey uh, abstains. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. <coughs> Dr. Dance is presenting, uh, our next item is uh, um, new business report on the superintendent's proposed uh, operating budget. Um, Dr. Dance uh, is presenting his 
2017 operating budget. Tonight is the presentation. At the January 19 board meeting, the board will have the opportunity to ask questions. If the board has any questions prior to that meeting, please submit them to Dr. Dan so that the staff will be prepared to answer your questions. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board. Um, Happy New Year. Um, it's always the um, best time of the year for me when I'm able to present my proposed operating budget to this board. And one of the fundamental responsibilities of the board is to approve a school system budget that we can submit to the county executive for inclusion in the county's budget um, proposal. Before I begin, though, I have to say a special thank you to several staff members who work with me 12 months throughout the year and just putting our budget together, but also implementing our budget as well, too. So Kevin Smith, thank you so much for your support as our Chief Administrative and Operations Officer. George Saris, um, is George in the room? Thank you so much for your support as our Executive Director of Fiscal Services, but also our new Budget Director, which we threw him completely into the fire, Whitney Taintliff. Um, thank you so much for being here as well, too. And Whitney, as soon as you began, we began spending many hours together in looking at this budget proposal. In addition, I would like to also recognize and thank her for her support, and that's Joy Schaefer uh, from the County um, Executive's Office. Thank you so much um, for your support. We work very closely um, with our funding authorities, not just at the state level, but most importantly at the county level, where over half of the county's budget goes directly to education. So thank you so much, Joy, and also you, Arrester, for your support from the County Executive's Office. But aside from hiring staff, our, my budget proposal is one of the biggest decisions that I make um, to this Board of Education, and it begins with a process. It's a 12-month process that we have, but it really is informed a lot by what students are telling me. Whether it's my student advisory, whether it's our student member of the board, whether it's our student town hall meeting, students have a big voice in the budget process with me as superintendent. Meeting with individual board members in terms of what are some interests that board members have in terms of our goals and directions of the school system, our staff, our elected officials, our bargaining units. I know we have Bill Lawrence, we have Abby here as well too. But many of our advisory committees, we have five area advisories who meet frequently throughout the year, who submit budget proposals and recommendations to me to include in the proposed operating budget to submit to this board. And so the process is an ongoing process, but it's really built on our people and their opinion and also our core values. And at the top of our core values, it's all about learning. We exist and we're a $1.8 billion organization because of the teaching and learning that happens in our classrooms. It's all about our leadership, it's our teachers, it's the organizational culture that we're creating as members of Team BCPS, and it's really the relationships that we have in working with each other, not just within the school system, but our over 800,000 residents um, within our county. So I'd like to take a, a trip back to 2012-2013. And that's when, as a school system, and I'm saying school system because all of the members of our community helped design Blueprint 2.0. We had 12 years under Blueprint for Progress with the previous administration with Dr. Harrison, and we came together as a community and decided on Blueprint 2.0. This was when, if you go back to our transition report um, from my first year as superintendent, we met with over 2,000 people. We held over 200 community meetings. Blueprint 2.0 was not a Dallas Dan strategic plan. This was Baltimore County's strategic plan about our way forward. And the primary avenue that we focused on was really that theory of action, where equity was really driving what we do, giving kids everything that they need personally. We knew it was going to be tough, but what we decided as a community is that if we want our students to graduate globally competitive, then two things needed to happen. They need to have access to an equitable digital learning environment, and they need to learn a second language prior to graduation. And I remember when, we had, when the board adopted this plan back in June of 13, there were folks who questioned the ambitious nature of the plan. We knew that it was going to be tough. We talked about transformation, what it would look like. We knew that there would be opportunities where we actually had to support each other throughout that transformation. But we were also very much clear that the Board of Education drove this plan based on community input when we put Blueprint 2.0 together. And so that continues to, to, to drive us. It continues to drive our equity conversations about giving students exactly what they need in order to support their growing, whether it's accelerating their instruction, whether it's catching them up, whether it's providing professional development to our employees, which is our biggest asset. How do we provide equity in the decisions that we make? And this board, through policy 0100, went on record saying that they wanted equity to drive those decisions. So when I think about my, my first three budget proposals as superintendent, I had the same three budget principles, managing growth, raising the bar, and closing gaps, and then how do we make sure that we're investing in our future? 
So if we think back to my first three budget proposals, we actually increased the number of school-based positions we had to nearly 300 positions that we increased. We looked at our large elementary schools and said, how do we provide additional administrative but also student support services support to those schools? We looked at having a social worker, a full-time social worker in every one of our high schools. And we also knew that the backbone of our organization was the support personnel on the operation side to provide security, maintenance, and transportation support to our schools too. And this board adopted that, but they also the county made sure that it was included in the county budget proposal as well. When we looked at raising the bar and closing gaps, we knew that we had to redesign our curriculum because the new Maryland College and Career Ready standards were in front of us. We need to look at our new educational options that we provide our kids, not just looking at, you know, what are we offering during the school day, but also how do we expand our offerings either online or on weekends or through credit recovery. We were very clear as a community we wanted to continue investing in pre-K, and we have well over 3,000 students participating in our pre-K programs today. We knew that we wanted to provide additional support to our ESOL students or our English learners because that was a growing population. We weren't providing the necessary supports to that group. But we also knew that based on our theory of action, we wanted to initiate our passport program where our kids, and um, Ms. Bern, um, Charlene actually talked about it in her report, where our kids are learning Spanish instruction over the fourth and fifth grade year prior to going into middle school. We also knew we wanted to invest in the future. If we think back to Baltimore County back in 1984, if we think back to some of the decisions we should have made or could have made then, where we'll be existing now in 2016. So what we want to do is make some pretty comprehensive, very strategic decisions so that the Baltimore County in 2026 or 2036 is Baltimore County that's set up for success based on the decisions we've made investing in that future. And we really wanted to say that our future really depended on our people. How do we pay our people well, provide appropriate benefits to them? And so the last three budget proposals really increased employee compensation. It looked at our technology infrastructure um, because we did not have schools with basic Wi-Fi and technology infrastructure prior to 2012. We knew that we wanted to make sure our employees and students were kept safe, so we created the Office of Safety and Security. We looked at some additional security upgrades in terms of our Raptor and our one card system. We looked at how do we make sure we pilot initiatives that we want to do prior to expansion, but we learned from those. Those were innovation labs and innovation schools. And so looking at lighthouse schools at the elementary and the middle school level were ways that we literally looked at investing um, in our future. So who we are based on the last three years of budget proposals that have been put forward and board adopted budget proposals is that we have a very diverse Baltimore County. Uh, we always talk about the fact that Baltimore County is not the same Baltimore County that it was in 1985. It's not the same Baltimore County that it's going to be in 2035, but we are a majority minority school system. And when you think about the fact that with that, all of our students have a diverse set of needs that we need to make sure that we're providing those, those students access to various equitable opportunities. We think about the fact that our students who qualify for free reduced lunch and that population has grown. And I know that some people may see the statistic that we've gone down a point or two, but that's statistically insignificant. Because if you think about the 52,000 students who qualify for free or reduced lunch in Baltimore County Public Schools, these are more schools that students who are enrolled in DC public schools combined. And so we have to make sure we're providing support to our students to make sure that we're raising the bar for all students and providing them support in order to meet that bar that we've raised for them. We also look at the number of English learner students who we've got, that has increased over the last 10 years, the number of homeless students in our county over the last 10 years. And I always remind people that the number of homeless students that we report are based on the number of students who self-report to us. So if students want to stay in a school through the McKinney-Vento Act, then absolutely we will know if those students are considered homeless and we provide additional supports to that student and that family. But many times we may not know. So in terms of providing additional supports to students, we have to make sure we do that. But we always have to talk about the fact that while our population are changing, we have a really good school system in Baltimore County. And we provide the necessary supports to our students, to our teachers, and with our successes, now that's the reason why we have 23 Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools today. And I was very excited, Ms. Causey, you were there with me, um, Chairman McDaniels was there, uh, Vice Chair Gillis, when Hereford High School and Carver Center for Arts and Technology became our two newest Maryland Blue Ribbon Schools, bringing that total to 23. We now have 18 national Blue Ribbon Schools. Pine Grove Elementary School became a national Blue Ribbon School just this year. Three quarters of our high schools still rank among the nation's top 9% of high schools across the country. We have a graduation rate that's one of the highest that we've had in years, and it exceeds the state average. We actually, when we think about equity, more of our students are taking the ACT and more college-level courses in order to be prepared when they get there. We also have more students who are actually, um, or fewer students who are actually dropping out of our school system. And what's really exciting to me is if you look at the gap that exists in our graduation rate, Baltimore County statistically has closed the achievement gap in terms of by race in the graduation rate. 
which is one of the few school systems in the country that have done that. We have much more work to do around our gender gap, but in terms of race-based gaps, we've done a lot of work around that. Baltimore County has our first National Teacher of the Year now, Sean McComb, and mo many times when people become Teacher of the Year, they actually leave the classroom, and what Sean wanted to do is come back and provide that year of support that he had given around the country back to Baltimore County. Dr. Mark Bedell, who's at one of our community meetings tonight, was most recently appointed to a national committee working with school resource officers. And we also think about our successes. Ryan Imbriali, who works directly with us as one of our executive directors, was most recently recognized by Intel as an educational innovator. Um, we actually have Don Roberts Mar uh, Mark, who's at Scott's Branch, and Ms. Johnson, you were there um, when, when she was recognized for her national award. Nora Murray, who works with our student um, advisory council, was most recently recognized for her national work, working with student leadership uh, development. Halstead Academy, under the leadership of Jen Mullinex, was most recently recognized nationally by our president for the transformation work that she's done in leadership with Halstead Academy with RISE, which is a part of the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative. Southwest Academy, under the leadership of Karen Barnes, we actually have Joshua Forhawk, who actually just most recently received a national award. And the work that we're doing around STAT is being recognized, and I'll talk about this, because it's being recognized for the planning that took place. So when a lot of individuals talk about STAT and some of the attention that has been given, clearly it's been about the 18 months of planning that went into before any device was ever purchased. So when people compare Baltimore County and the work that we're doing around it, much of the work right now is talking about the deliberate planning that's taken place. And the fact that when the plan is in place, no one's afraid to adjust the plan, as I'll talk about a little bit later uh, during my presentation. Because of the work the board is doing around equity, we've been given outside philanthropic support in the, t in the tune of $1.5 million from the Kellogg Foundation. And we have other philanthropic groups who want to work with us, but we're very, very cautious about those who we work with. And last but not least, we are known as one of the best communities for music education, and we have had that for well over a decade now. So building on the foundation of our prior budget proposals, we now present to you the fiscal year 17 proposed operating um, request. But before we do that, let's look at our fiscal reality. Baltimore County Public Schools has no authority to tax, bond, or issue debt. So we actually work directly with our, our, our state funding partners, with our county funding partners to make sure they understand the investment they make in public education and the return on that investment. But again, I have to commend the county because over half of the county's budget does go directly to educational support. We're going under the assumption that state aid to education is fully funded. And for the third consecutive year, we will have a county uh, budget request or proposed budget request that asks the county for an above maintenance of effort for the third consecutive year. So again, keeping with our three budget principles, let's talk about managing growth. Baltimore County Public Schools since 2008 has been increasing our enrollment. And if you think about where we are right now and where we will be in just 10 years, we're projected almost 8,000 students over the next decade. At the next board meeting, uh, I should say, um, in the next few board meetings, we'll be sharing with our board our student counts, which really looks at our 10-year enrollment projections. We work very, very closely with the county on those enrollment projections as it drives many of our capital decisions, many of our operating decisions as well, too. But we're projecting over 1,200 students to enroll in Baltimore County Public Schools for next year. But while we talk about our enrollment, we traditionally always talk about our enrollment in terms of sto uh, total student enrollment growth. But we have special populations that we need to support that we've never truly traditionally talked about managing growth. And so I really want to say a special thank you to CCAC for working with me over the last couple years to really talk about how do we support our managing growth as it relates to our students with disabilities. As you can see from the slide, we've actually had multiple disabilities, our autism population, but also our developmentally delayed population. That's also grown over the last four fiscal years, but we've not provided that additional support in the classroom supporting those students, but also supporting our teachers who have to manage those caseloads. And at the same time, we have 14% of our student population who, um, who actually are students with disabilities, but we've never provided the additional support even though our total enrollment has gone up. In addition, let's talk about our English learners. Well, at the same time, we have over 4,000 English learners, and you see where Spanish is the primary um, language of our students, you start, you start to see that we have over 80 languages that are spoken in Baltimore County with over 100 countries represented. So we can't just say that we look at our total enrollment and provide our managing growth number that way for class sizes. We have to provide additional English learner support for those students and our classes as well, too. So when I think about our operating budget requests this year for managing growth, 
I'm actually asking for nearly 77 FTEs for our total student enrollment growth, which is about 1,225 students that we're projecting. But in the area of special education, I'm asking for 60 additional FTEs to support special education students um, within our school system. This will primarily look at our support at the elementary level, where we actually have in some cases elementary teachers who are supporting 50 students on their caseload, which is far too many. And far too many at times we do not provide the support to our elementary students. But this also will look at roughly about 17 positions at the transitional grades, whether it's from fifth to sixth grade or eighth to ninth, where we really work with students and families as they transition um, to a new learning environment. In addition, last year we talked to this board about, and it was funded by our county, having a three-year phase-in of English learner teachers to support our English learner population. To really look at not the fact that we have, uh, and we do have English learner students across the entire county, but in the Owens Mills High School feeder pattern, the Delaney High School feeder pattern, and the Lansdowne High School feeder pattern, we need to provide some strategic support to our English learners. So this budget proposal asks for over 16 FTEs to support that. We have a number of Southwest area construction projects going on right now, so we'll be asking for about $1 million in startup costs for those renovated elementary schools. We've heard from our nurses in our schools and our health supervisor that we have many of our large elementary schools that have growing populations of students with health needs, and so the providing additional health assistance to our schools will be beneficial. In addition to the fact that as we bring on new facilities, we also have to bring on more custodial and maintenance support for that as well, too. So you look at our total managing growth FTE population, I'm asking for nearly 158 positions to manage growth within our school system, not just looking at, again, total enrollment, but also our student population growth as well, too. When we think about raising the bar and closing gaps, looking at our academic program, one of the things that we've been very confident as a county is that we want to maintain our pre-K efforts. And again, we have nearly 3,300 students, or a little more than 3,300 students who are participating in pre-K, and these are not students we receive state dollars for. These are students we're all locally supporting through our county um, budget request. So again, Joy, thank you so much for your support as well, too. But this budget proposal will actually maintain the current pre-K levels that we, in fact, have. We're asking for about $7 million in instructional materials and resources so that we can provide additional supports, not just in the core content areas, but in art, music, and dance, but also in CTE as well, too. When we think about diagnostic tools and resources, when we look at our park results and, and making sure that our students are reading on grade level before they leave grade three, we're asking for about $1.8 million to look at those diagnostic tools and those supplemental resources to not just provide first instruction for kids, but also intervention supports for kids as well, too. A part of that $1.8 million is also looking at our math program at the middle school level, too, making sure that we provide more students an option to get on the track for Algebra 1 prior to leaving middle school. In addition to raising the bar and closing gaps in what I mentioned before, um, the budget proposal does ask for 11 FTEs for our passport program. So one of the things in working with the Center for Applied Linguistics, which is doing our third party research um, for our passport program, and I know Ms. Johnson, you said this um, to us as well too, and we've also talked to some students, when they get in the fifth grade, they want more access to their Spanish teacher. And so before they go into middle school, how do we provide more access to their Spanish teacher? We want to provide additional teachers to actually assist with the passport program. So the budget proposal looks at increasing the number of passport schools from 25 this year to 40 next year. But we're going to have about 25 of those schools where kids will be learning Spanish in fifth grade. So the 11 FTEs will work directly with our fifth graders to make sure they've mastered and become proficient in language prior to going to middle school. We're asking for about $100,000 in magnet program support to support our magnet offerings, which you have a great portfolio of this. But one thing this person will be doing primarily is working with our international baccalaureate program within Baltimore County. Right now, we have an international baccalaureate program at Kenwood High School, and we have it at Milford Mill Academy. But we really want to expand what we're doing at Kenwood High School, because right now, and Deeksha, you uh, and I've had this conversation as well, too, it's mostly a diploma years program, meaning kids only get access to the program their junior, senior year. We want to create a middle years program, not just at Kenwood for grades 9 and 10, but also how do we create a middle years program at Stemmers Run Middle School that will feed directly into Kenwood. So our goal is that if kids are taking IB efforts in the middle school level, then they'll extend that effort right into Kenwood as a ninth grader, and we have more students graduating with an IB diploma. And last but not least, our early, uh, early college access. We have over 1,000 students who are taking advantage of early college access programs that we have either through our two-year institution with CCBC or with our four-year institutions. And so as a system, we pay for that. And so part of raising the bar and closing the gap is really thinking about how do we provide more op options to kids as they go into the 16-17 school year with early college access. 
And last but not least, investing in the future. And this is all about our people. I think about investing in the future in terms of people, facilities, and technology. So right now, as we're negotiating with all five of our bargaining units around salary increases and cost of living adjustments for next year, I'm nearly a $34 million placeholder in the budget as we finish those negotiations. Um, we will bring those negotiations, of course, back to the Board of Education for final approval. But as a placeholder right now, we have $34 million in just salaries. But if you add the benefits in it, too, because we want to pay our employees well and provide an appropriate benefit package, we have nearly $40 million that we have in our budget for employee salaries and benefits. But one of the things we also want to do, and this is really working directly with our community, and we realize this, we have to do some work with our bus drivers in terms of paying them appropriately as well, too. And so the budget proposal looks at how do we actually enhance our driver pay so that we recruit the best drivers, that we retain our best drivers. And so in working with our bargaining units, we want to actually have roughly $700,000 to readjust our bus driver pay so that we don't just recruit our best drivers, but we also retain them at the same time. We think about our facilities. We actually have aging facilities and we need to maintain them. So one of the things this budget request will do is really ask for nearly $3 million to maintain our current facilities as part of schools for our future as we bring on new schools. And last, as we look at investing in the future, then we actually allocate additional and ask for additional money for technology. So let's talk about STAT for a little bit. When we started planning for STAT back in 2012, and you will hear me say this a lot, it was 18 months of planning that really looked at for the 16, 17 school year, we scale up in all middle schools. But in being very deliberate in what's happening with our curriculum redesign, what we're seeing in our classroom, but also where we want our students to be as we truly transform teaching and learning and look at organizational capacity to deal with a massive change. We're looking at how do we be more strategic in terms of our approach with STAT. So currently right now we have STAT in grades K-5 of our Lighthouse schools. We want to go back and look at our kindergarten approach. We think that we can provide technology for our students with a different approach in kindergarten, but we're seeing some pretty solid results in grades one through five. Where we're seeing students who are reading on grade level more, students who are more excited and more engaged in that process. You'll hear our principals who will talk about discipline being down, engagement being up. And so I would invite anyone to let's have a conversation and have a visit to many of our elementary schools. But when we look at 107 elementary schools, we need to differentiate our support to make sure all schools are getting the individual supports that they need. We have seven middle school lighthouse schools right now, but we're adjusting our plan to say how next year with this budget proposal, we actually have our lighthouse schools at the middle school level go grades six and seven only. So not bringing on eighth grade, but really having the device transition with the kids in grades six and seven. And with our remaining 20 middle schools looking at grade six only. So we think about that transition from fifth to sixth grade, making sure kids are organized, they're adjusting from having one or two teachers to having six or seven teachers, and how do we make sure we really provide them access to a high quality English, math, science, and history, but also an extracurricular opportunity as well through STAT. In addition, this budget proposal looks at if you're really going to transform high schools, you can't bring on individual grades. You're going to have to bring on the entire school when you actually look at your approach with staff for high schools. So with this budget proposal, we're asking for the expansion of three lighthouse high schools in grades 9 through 12 um, in those three high schools only. So again, if you think about our strategic plan for STAT, this is quite different from the original plan. But we've realized that planning really results in where we are today. We make adjustments to the plan accordingly. And I want to say a special thank you to our staff, our community, but also especially thank you to our principals and teachers. Because if you go into schools, they will talk to you about the massive undertaking of changing the culture of a school when you actually have students take ownership of their learning. Because kids today are learning quite different than even when I was in school. And so when we actually look at what we're doing around STAT, we have a long way to go. But we also know we want to be very strategic in our approach with our planning. In addition, we think about our technology infrastructure and our maintenance. We work a lot of times with the county in terms of systems that talk to each other, similar systems. And so as we update our servers, our financial system, we're actually asking for about $9 million to make sure we have updated servers and technology infrastructure. So when you think about the whole pie in terms of requests that I have, investing in the future is the biggest part. And again, when you think about $40 million of that is all salaries and benefits. But I give you the breakdown in terms of $10 million for managing growth, $10 million for raising the bar and closing gaps, and nearly $67 million for investing in the future of Baltimore County. So with our proposed general fund revenue for 2017, we're asking for about a $1.45 billion budget, which is a nearly $60 million increase from our current FY16 budget. You see the breakdown in what we're asking for the county, what we're asking for the state, and our other, meaning our federal um, revenues as well as other sources. But the general fund budget alone is $1.45 million um, request. 
If you think about our overall budget, and again, this is where we have to differentiate the difference between our capital budget, which is one-time um, expenses, and our operating budget, which is ongoing expenses, um, you see the total budget of about a 1.8 proposed budget for FY17 with about a 1.45 general fund budget, which looks at a change of about 4.3%. Again, you heard me talk about our increase of asking for above maintenance of effort. This is roughly a 2.2% increase over maintenance of effort of what we're asking for. Our special revenue fund is all of our grant funds, whether it's with Title I or through IDEA, of about an 8.9% increase. And so our operating budget, again, 1.54 if you look at our special revenue fund added as well. The internal service fund is where we've actually now, we've been self-insured in terms of our workers' comp uh, budget. Our capital funds budget went down a little bit because this is a non-bonding year for the county. Our debt service fund to pay the debts on our bonds, um, and which is still housed with us even though we have no um, authority to issue bonds um, or issue debt. And last, our enterprise fund, which is our food, nutrition, service um, fund, with a total operating budget, or I should say proposed all fund budget, of about $1.8 billion. So this is a process. We, we begin the process with me rolling it out to the, um, the, the board tonight. We're asking the board to um, approve its operating budget so that I can submit it to the county executive for inclusion in the county request at its February 2nd meeting. But before we get there, the board will have a public hearing next Tuesday night at 6.30 in this building on the proposed operating budget request. In addition to some other avenues or some other um, concepts the board wanted to um, discuss at that meeting. We're hoping for no snow, but if there is a snow, um, that happens Tuesday, um, then we will have the snow date being the next day, which is that Wednesday, January 13. The board will hold a work session um, on the operating budget request on the 19th at 6.30 in this building. Um, and I would ask, again, I know the chair said this as well too, if board members have any individual questions they would like answered, please do not hesitate to call me or submit those to myself and staff so we can make sure all those answers are provided for the board um, at that time. Board will again vote on the 2nd of February and I have to, by law, submit it to the county executive by March 1st for inclusion in the county budget. When the county executive um, gets it on March 1st by law, we'll work directly with his staff to make sure that they understand elements that we are asking for in the board's budget at that time. Uh, but then the county executive in mid-April will roll out the county um, budget, which will include the capital and the operating for fiscal year 17. Once the county executive rolls it out in his budget, then we'll be working with county council as they adopt a budget for the county. Um, and that will happen in mid-May. So this is a budget process that starts with the first step of us actually sharing the budget proposal for fiscal year 17. And again, as I end that, I want to say a special thank you to staff uh, for working with me on this budget proposal. A special thank you to CCAC for working with me on this budget proposal and our students and our board members for working with me on this budget proposal as well. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, <clears throat> Again, um, thank you for your report. And, and just as a, a general comment or a thought um, to follow up your presentation, um, on the components of the budget that are associated with um, academic performance or raising the bar and managing growth, um, one of the ways I was thinking that we could uh, enhance our effort is, is being very data-driven and as we start down the road, you know, set some tangible goals that go along with the investment. And uh, I know Mr. Stewart and I have talked about um, ways that the board and the system work together so we can clearly know where we are going and where we stand as uh, we invest these money. So we'll submit some thoughts to you over the next week, but I think that should be kind of one component in our thinking um, is how we assure ourselves as we move through the process that um, we have data and information that show that we're going in the right direction. And, and this is not to, again, choke somebody if things don't go well. It's all to work together to make sure we uh, are spending our money responsibly and um, moving in the right direction. So that's yes, just sir. a thought. Okay. So, okay. So again, board members have the opportunity over the next week to um, submit questions and thoughts so that in our work session at the next meeting that we can address them. And also, um, again, a reminder that um, there is a public hearing on Tuesday, January 12th here at 6.30 and the sign up will start at 5.30. So uh, we'll get input from the public also. All right, our next agenda item is uh, public comment on uh, policies. Uh, the first policy, we do have sign-ups. Uh, we have three 
Uh, com uh, folks signed up for comment on policy 1100 on community relations. Our first uh, speaker will be uh, Bosch Farone, who will be followed by Joanne Simpson. Good evening again. Good evening. My apology for my voice. And I'm not really organized today, so bear with me if I didn't make sense. <laughs> Uh, policy 1100, am I correct, Mr. Yes, Chairman? That's correct. Okay. So, I really appreciate the additions uh, in that policy and in that uh, philosophy part, uh, the last sentence, and the global community and actively seeks community input. Um, as you know, um, uh, Ms. Romaine Williams, made in public invitation for me to attend the PRC after several times asking myself to be a recognized member. And of course, I really never really received any invitation by email or mail or phone call. I don't know really the time and date and location of the meeting. So what I'm seeing here, which is really a general comment plus that specific part that I mentioned to you in relation to my request being a member in PRC that if we, the school system, the Board of Education, are actively seeking community input, then the least bit is to basically shoot an email and really ask me to come in at a certain date. Um, I, I just want to make sure that it's clear my request to be a member in PRC even though that the board didn't really have in the past a public person be a member in PRC, I just don't really see the point of excluding someone uh, with my experience, with my dedication to the Board of Education. By next month, I will complete 11 years uh, coming to you here, even though that I'm sick today, I'm really kind of committed to coming in. I actually really enjoy it, enjoy being with you. Uh, my intention is not to give gray hair to anyone. Mm -hmm. My intention is to be positively involved so I don't really have to come and speak to you in public as much as I have done in 11 years. So um, having said all that in so many words, sometime in my experience of the past 43 years being a citizen and active physician here in the U.S., sometime it's really better to have an opposition person or group from within rather than from the outside. Um, and I, I think keeping people outside is, is just really harmful in all aspects of life, you know. So I, I hope you take my request in a positive way and you will make the words of this proposed PRC changes in reality and not just really in words. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Shall um, I stay or leave? Uh, no, we'd, we'll go through all the comments on this particular part of the policy. Uh, Joanne Simpson is next. Well, I pretty much said my piece before, so you don't need to call me up again. Um, I just want to make sure I had a chance <laughs> oh. today. But I did want to say on community input, I would really urge you to um, have an open-ended survey of students, teachers, and parents about what the pros and cons of STAT are and of the one-to-one, -one, not the Speak Up survey, which really is looking for mostly positive outcomes, but to have an open-ended conversation about what's really going on so that it, it is not necessarily a done deal that we just push forward and sort of pressure people to buy in instead of really getting good feedback. And I would think that should be done as part of the pilot instead of expanding it so quickly to the elementary schools, and that's all I wanted to say. So Thank don't call me up again, because this is all very nerve-wracking for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Our uh, next speaker on policy 1100 is Garrison McClaney. Same thing. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, we'll, we'll move on then to uh, policy 2342, and the only speaker signed up is Dr. Farone. That's um, administration, uh, administrative operations. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Again, this is policy 2342, and um, Again, I reflect uh, on my experience with the board for the past 11 plus years um, <coughs> about the engagement and the, the additions in this policy really shows how we as a school system want teachers and parents to be included and members in PTSA. Um, so in my first four years, uh, five years here, I really tried very hard to be part of the group, and I have been pushed back in so many ways, so I basically gave it up. Um, I noticed um, from the list of stakeholders out there that we have 15 stakeholder committees, and one of them, I think it has four or maybe six subgroups. Uh, so in reality, we have about 19. Uh, I've seen only involvement of average of three in the Board of Education um, most of the time. So the policy really encourages people to be members, but I think the board needs to be more communicative with the community to make them feel comfortable enough to be active participant. And again, I reflect on my experience. When I get pushed down or pushed away, um, you know, what for? You know, I, I don't want to be a member in a PTSA that the president of that group does not really want somebody who would say something different than him or her. So um, again, I appeal to you to put the words in action. Um, that's really my message to you and to do that in so many ways that uh, would make really all of us active participants and not really just really names on the list, not just 15 or 19 stakeholders and you have two or three that come in and really participate in the meeting and the rest, where are they? You know, I don't see them. Okay. Now, Thank you, you. you can really stay there uh, for the next policy because we can, we're, we're moving on to the policy 5000. This is uh, on students and you're signed up uh, as our first uh, speaker. Uh, this one, Mr. Chairman and board members, um, relates, okay, let me pick on, on item number two, uh, letter D, uh, about access and equitable. Um, equitable, safe, conducive to learning. Um, you know, so that conducive to learning, that's about air conditioners, about safety, etc. Uh, equitable, again, I really go back to uh, putting the words in actions. So equity, when I hear really our leaders talk about school system, uh, money being diverted to certain areas of Baltimore County um, that are more favorable politically, which is really a fact, I mean, well known, um, that really does not match the words that are intended here. And of course, and I'm really not trying to bore you, but the holidays is about equitableness. Um, you know, so if we have really word here about equitable, the holidays when it's addressed by the board should be equitable, and equitable means equitable. It, it should not really mean anything else. Um, item number F uh, also goes back to um, engage parents and guardians and business and community. Um, I have lots of money <coughs> to kind of give out, but I really never really thought of donating to the school system because I feel as an outsider. My family does, my community does, and so forth. So, you know, when people come to you as board members and speak to you and they really don't get a response by email or letter, or at least really right there on the spot, then what's the point of being engaged? Engaged is a two-way street. So basically, I ask you really to put these words for 
real action and and really implement them in the way they they mean um, last um, which I asked really before, I just don't really see the point of the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy. And I really never heard an answer why do we really need to do it. I can't really imagine that the Board of Education will make any policy or any decision and the superintendent would not really follow it. You know, I, I just think it's really redundant. It's more ink, more, you know, I just, <laughs> you know, I don't know, unless the, I'm missing something. So uh, I know my voice is failing me, but uh, hopefully my brain is not. And thank you for being patient. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Dr. Chairman, very quickly, uh, Dr. Ferron, I think I heard you say correctly, you have a lot of money to donate, but you don't, <laughs> uh, you don't donate it because of some reason. But I just wanted to wonder, if you wanted to donate any to board members. <laughs> I, I would seriously consider that. <laughs> well, well, I, I'm available. Please, please be first I thought you were going to ask for air conditioning for Kenwood. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better idea. <laughs> OK. Um, thank our, you very much. Thank you. Our uh, last speaker for policy 5000 is Miss Marion Moore. That was a long wait. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New, New Year. Year. <laughs> when I was eight years old, I competed in track and field, and one of my favorite events was the 4 by 100 relay. I was often chosen to be the anchor or the last leg, which meant my coach believed that I had the capacity to win the final race for my team. So even if it appeared that we were losing, I told myself before I received the baton that we would be the winners. As a result today, this equity and education race I am running means so much more to me, for I represent students of the human race. So with that said, try not to judge anyone based on their race, religion, gender, or income, because you never know if that person can be your anchor. My name is Marion Moore, and I am here to represent my startup company, Compete With Purpose, LLC. With 15 years of experience competing in the Junior Olympics as a runner and being a part of basketball championship teams, my mission is to make students and teachers feel like winners and compete like champions. As a motivational coach, I strive to integrate sports discipline with academics in order for students and teachers to become more globally competitive leaders. In retrospect, as a former educator, I noticed that students and teachers had similarities with athletes and coaches. For example, a star athlete could be compared to a gifted and talented student. Now, some star athletes may have an arrogant attitude or some may be very withdrawn and mainly focus on improving their game. Also, other star athletes may not come to practice on time or even disrespect their coaches and teammates, but still get playing time due to their superior athleticism or charismatic personality. On the other hand, there are some players on a team who are labeled as not good enough or average, who come to practice on time, work hard, and have a positive attitude, but the coach is impatient with them. Often these players are overlooked, and if they make one or two mistakes in the game, they're back on the bench watching from the sidelines. Why is that? Is it because the so-called average player is not gifted and talented? Of course not. However, that is the reason why it's vital in education that we ensure that all students have a great balance between being compassionate and competitive learners so that they will be able to carry those valuable gifts and talents to the corporate workforce. As a former teacher, my goal was to consistently humble anyone who thought they were more than and actively encourage anyone that felt like they were less than, which defines equity in education. And it's when we create balance among learners so that they are not any labels on students or titles on schools because everyone will be provided with the proper support 
and resources needed to succeed. Thank you. Hashtag compete with purpose. And I just want you all to really consider. Um, I wish you all the luck with your initiatives, including STAT. And as a former uh, Th technology team. Thank you, Ms. Your, your time a, is up now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for your comments. Thank you very much. As a former teacher, I initiated a STAT program. And I know what the, the, the um, disadvantages and advantages are. So I just want you to keep in mind when people are providing you with um, suggestions to perhaps meet with them and discuss. Like, don't judge, but just give me an opportunity to meet with you. And I can tell you a lot of things that can save you money and time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. All right, our um, next agenda item is, uh, is uh, board member comments. Um, we usually start that side. This week I'll start with Mr. Birch, perhaps, if he's Mr. Hasn't. Chairman, yes. for, uh, since I'm a newbie, I, I, I was told that we had a six-month grace period for making mistakes. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, in terms of? I wasn't sure what the process was for the board members to make comment on the policies. Do we, I get an opportunity well, to do that? Um, is this, this is the first, is this a, what read, this is second, second read. We'll have, we'll have uh, time between now and the time we vote on the policies for additional comments. Okay, so. And you can submit them in writing. Just do it in writing then? Yes, so please. board members don't do it during the meeting? Um, no, no, no. That we haven't really, because we have opportunity to interact with the PRC routinely but yeah and, be, and, and just for the record I mean Dr. Ferron's sake as I see he's all coded up and ready to go the next PRC meeting is uh, January 11th at 5:30, and then January 25th at 5:30. and just for, for informational purposes in years past PRC was not an open meeting um, the board in an effort to create more transparency, voted that PRC and several other uh, of, a, of the board's committees would be open. Um, and those meeting times are public, and they are announced public, publicly. But we don't single out any one person to send an email to. But now all of PRC's meetings and several other committee meetings are open to the public. I believe everyone except audit. And they are on the website. They are they are readily available. So. No one needs a personal invitation. invitation. Exactly. Anyone can go on the website, look for the committee meetings, the dates and the times, and the public is welcome to attend. And, and Dr. Ferron, if you check your email, you'll see I sent you a personalized invitation to come to next week's PRC meeting. <laughs> and Ms. Williams, just for clarification with Ms. Miller, she can email the, yeah. right, okay, to, to thank you. And I'll go back to Mr. Virch, do you have any? comments for this evening mr birch i'd like to commend the superintendent for um proposing uh additional positions for special education and acknowledging that uh, this board and uh, the public schools have not uh, provided enough resources for our special education student population i commend the superintendent it was the right thing to do the time has come to do that um i do note unfortunately as i must that the uh, student teacher ratios do not change from uh, last year unless something happens with uh, either the number of folks we hire or the um, uh, the number of students who come and uh, i know that that is a that's something that's noticed by a lot of folks and that does not change in this new budget secondly in terms of the board's interest which is serving um, uh, the families of students in our in our county I note that there is no according to the briefing I received last month no additional staffing for our own auditor the auditor who reports directly to this board there's no additional staffing and while it's important that uh, you know our audit staff keeps an eye on what happens with uh, you know those sums of monies in each and every one of the schools there is the issue of of the programs and the funding for those programs and whether they are serving and producing the quality students that we want um, I also note um, in, in, in my briefing, I was advised that there is no increase in the number of stat teachers. This is significant to the extent it belies the image of us enhancing um, uh, student-centered learning. 
And the fact is, if we have the same number, or if we're not hiring any additional ones, then we're not uh, going after that part of the vision in Blueprint, Blueprint 2.0. Secondly, um, in my briefing, I was advised that the, the staff development funding for STAT is the same as it was in the last budget. So while there are things that we should be happy about, and I'm glad to see there's still more work to be done, and I uh, hope to forward my written questions to uh, the central office staff, and I appreciate their timely response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Ms. Miller? Ms. Johns? Okay, thank you. I don't have any comments to Mr. Collins? Uh, quickly, I have, I have a couple. Um, I want to uh, <clears throat> give a particular shout out to uh, a couple of teachers I read about in the paper at Towson High School. On December 29th, the Sun paper had a, an article that was a full, a full page headline at Towson High School, a lesson in kindness. And the teachers were um, Ms. Jenna Zava, Z-A-V-A, and Ms. Claire Fluharty, F-L-U-H-A-R-T-Y. They were English teachers who they uh, gave their students an act of kindness assignment. And the article is about that. Uh, lovely activity and it also says that the uh, principal or the administration I assume the principal uh, had to give permission because this wasn't part of the county curriculum and I want to applaud the administration for doing that and I want to applaud those folks uh, for doing that particular activity it was a lovely article I just thought we should recognize them publicly I also want to comment briefly and ask uh, you to read if you didn't get a chance to see it in the Sunday Sun paper the article by our good friend uh, Dr. Nancy Grasmick, with whom I fought many times when we were in the, I was in the legislature and she was the state superintendent of schools. But she has a, she has a very uh, thought-provoking article about understanding the brain in education, and indicating that brain imaging and widespread interest among researchers in brain development are transforming the practice of medicine in the 21st century and it, she believes that we need to uh, do that as well and transform educational practices. I had never really thought about that before, but um, uh, she indicates in this article that we should make a New Year's resolution that uh, student brain development and function be focused on and, they, and um, learn as much as we can about that so that we can incorporate that knowledge into our everyday instruction. It's very thought-provoking, and I know there's so many other thought-provoking things going on in education, but when Dr. Grasmick, uh, who's still working at Towson, I understand, uh, she's given so much of her time, energy, and talent to education. When she has something to say, I think uh, sometimes we need to take a look at it, and I would encourage you to do that as well. And I wish my good friend, uh, Nick Stewart, a happy next two weeks. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Collins, and we heard from you earlier. Mr. Gillis, do you have Yeah, real quickly, I want to uh, thank Dr. Dance for his wonderful presentation about the proposed operating budget. I look forward to the, uh, to the school system working with the county administration to ensure that we uh, get the funding that we can and the funding that we need to make <clears throat> the coming school year a great one. And I welcome uh, all who are uh, interested in this operating budget to come out on the 12th uh, to uh, uh, to the public hearing. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Mr. Yolfelder? Well, I'm Ms. Helen. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Thank you. First, I wanted to say congratulations to Linda Pop, who is the Visual Arts Coordinator for Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, she led a uh, sweep of the National Art Education Association Awards for the Eastern Region um, with many of our Baltimore County Public School educators. So I wanted to give her a shout out. Art's very important, I believe, for uh, especially the primary kids to develop their creativity, but also everyone needs to have an opportunity to find joy. And for so many of our students and even our adults, they can do that either through creating art or learning to appreciate the, uh, create, the creative endeavors of other folks. Um, next, I did also want to thank Dr. Dance for that presentation. I look forward to looking through the budget um, and also hearing from folks uh, at our public hearing on January 12th. Um, I did want to just wrap up finally the comments about air conditioning. I did a train two full days of equity training, and I do believe that it is very important for all of us to think about 
all of us. And in that training, one of the uh, common themes is to have courageous conversations around what is the truth and what is our perception of the truth and that we don't always need to agree and that it can be uncomfortable to be in disagreement. But as adults that are working towards the school system, as Ed said, for the whole school system, we really need to uh, embrace that. And I would say that uh, we need to go one step further. We need to take courageous action. There are things that have been done status quo year after year. As Marisol pointed out, the facilities problem didn't start with Dr. Dance. It started a long time ago, but it's gonna take some courageous action, some different thinking for us to solve the problem. So just to get to the numbers, the Department of General Services with the Maryland State Department of Education, when they did their feasibility study on installing window air conditioning units, identified over 1,100 classrooms overheating currently, negatively impacting the health and academic achievement of over 33,000 students and approximately 1,700 teachers. So that number will go down, but that number is very, very large, and to me, personally, in my opinion, unacceptable to go on for five years. Um, also, I believe that we should have a blended cooling model that's teacher and student-centered, which means not just air conditioning for the administrators and the, commu the uh, computer labs in some of these smaller schools. Also, uh, Mer uh, Romaine, excuse me, Ms. Williams already pointed out that the Policy Review Committee is Monday at 5.30. The public is welcome to attend. And we will continue our work. The Policy Review Committee has been working on the heat closure issues to try and take care of those students that are left in schools that are not air conditioned and also on possible air conditioning solutions. Um, also about the budget issues, I do agree with Steve Virch that our special education population has not gotten what they need, and I applaud Dr. Dance for uh, increasing that, and I really hope that, that uh, those positions get, get funded and get filled very quickly to take care of our students. Um, I also want to second what he said about our internal audit group. They in the past have done special education audits. They haven't done them um, for years. They also, as the student population increases, they have a lot more monies that they're handling through different schools. And I would also say that Debbie Decker, our own very uh, hardworking senior executive assistant, has not gotten any uh, additional support for her work, despite the fact that with all of our community outreach, which is outstanding, the inflow to her office has increased. So I would uh, let us think about that. Um, the next thing is that, um, I appreciate Dr. Dance pointing out about Hereford High School winning the Blue Ribbon War Award, and it is an outstanding award that they won for the, for the state of Maryland. I did find out from the Maryland State Department of Education, however, that that award is based on the last year that they had their highly successful semester block schedule, which was taken away in uh, November of 2013 and then put into place in uh, August of 2014. So I am um, not satisfied that the Hereford High School is doing as well. Franklin High School, when they had their schedule taken away, had to switch again the next year because the, that schedule didn't work out for them. So I had asked Dr. Dance to do a study impact on the high school schedule mandate that he has not done. And I would suggest that we do that so that we can truly evaluate what's happening. I know that you said you were gonna do it in two years, but we're studying Spanish as it happens, as we should, and we're studying STAT as it happens, as we should. Except to go to your word about being deliberate, um, you removed any control group opportunity which is necessary for accurate research when the uh, acceleration of STAT was done to put STAT into every elementary school rather than starting with the 10 lighthouse schools. So when we're talking about deliberate, I would say that uh, that's not quite accurate. Um, also related to STAT, I had heard about the Speak Up survey a number of times and talking about transparency. We did receive in our weekly update um, a full paragraph about the Speak Up survey, but I do believe it left out that uh, Mr. Imbriali is on the Project Tomorrow Advisory Council for surveys. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay, so that might have been helpful to know. And what I would suggest is that we try and plan a meeting with Mr. Imbriali and some of the folks 
that are concerned about surveys and, 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 and develop for our school system something that is an open-ended survey that does truly ref reflect all of the um, input and not just have it be directed towards technology as that Speak Up survey uh, seems to be doing. And also just in terms of uh, getting input, I had said from the beginning of my tenure, my short tenure starting back in July, that I want to be a fresh set of ears. I've heard from a number of areas that people are concerned about sending me emails and, and coming to meetings and talking. So I did get a post office box, 311 Sparks, Maryland, 21152. So anyone that wants to send a compliment, comment, suggestion, concern, Feel free to do that, and I will um, make sure all of my fellow board members understand what's coming through if anyone does that. And that's all for now. It's been very late, and uh, as someone once said, I have much more to say, but you don't want to hear it right now. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Williams, do you have any? Thank you. I, I also want to thank Dr. Dance for the presentation on the um, operating budget tonight. Um, I really appreciate the additional funding um, going towards special ed, but I am still concerned about the student-teacher ratio and would like some attention to be um, directed towards that. Um, there are a lot of great speakers and a lot of important information shared tonight. I would also ask that there be some consideration or follow-up with the um, concerns expressed by AFSCME. Um, I thought they were very serious concerns and would like for the board to have some kind of response as to what's going on with that situation. Um, again, PRC is open to the public and you are welcome. And uh, I guess um, last but not least, um, this is a new year. And it's all of our opportunities to make it a great year for our kids in Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Ms. Eaton. Yes, I would just like to say that I'm happy for the schools that will be receiving air conditioning, and my heart goes out to the schools who must wait. Thank you. Finally, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> I'll here. be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Brevity being the soul of wit. Uh, Senator Collins, thank you for your well wishes as my wife and I um, expect to welcome our first child into the world at any time here. I guess the future generation of our BCPS population, so I'll try to do her right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, again, uh, just a couple announcements for information. Uh, there's a revised superintendent's rule, 31. 26 available for your perusal uh, on non-instructional services and also superintendent's rule 3127 um, non-instructional services and travel approval um, as it's been said a couple times there's a hearing here public hearing on uh, january 12th topics do include the budget but also our heat policy related uh, um, issues and the superintendent's contract. You can sign up to speak as early as 5.30 p.m. and the meeting will start at 6.30 here at Greenwood. Uh, schools and offices are closed in observance of Martin Luther King's birthday on January 18th. Schools are also closed uh, for professional development on January 19th and the next board meeting will be here um, on January 19th at 6.30 p.m. So um, that's it for this evening. Our meeting is adjourned. <laughs>